All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, 2 Samuel 13 and 14. Man, who feels like we're just, we're, we're talking about like an ongoing drama series with the life of David? I mean, it's just crazy. And you throw in some adventure in there, you throw in some drama, you throw in some romance and a whole lot of sin. And yeah, you get the book of 2 Samuel. What's the saying? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, that would be very, very true in the story of 2 Samuel 13. Think about this. David had a lustful intent with his eyes for Bathsheba. And now here you're going to have uh, David's son, uh, Amnon. Amnon has this lustful thought and eyes for, this is weird, his half-sister. So it's a rape with incest at the same time. And so none of this is a good scenario, but I just, I'm talking through this process. So here's what I want to do, and we're going we're gonna to get to this. There's a, there's, a, there's a passage, 2 Timothy 2.22. I want to use this as a backdrop, and I really, really appreciate it. This comes from Luke, a guy named Luke Gilkerson. Normally I don't teach like this, but I, I want to for today, and it says this, Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And what we're going to do today is we're going to break up really the story into three main areas based on 2 Timothy 2.22. And so that very first section is flee from youthful passions. We're going to get to that, but I just, I want you to, I just want you to have that in the back of your mind as we go through some of this, some of this story, okay? So it says this in verse 1. Uh, some time had passed, and David's son Absalom, okay, had a beautiful sister named Tamar, okay? And I'll, just, I'll write these down here, okay? So you have Absalom, that would be David's son, and you have Tamar, David's daughter, right? Well, these two are full brother and sister. Is that how you say that? I don't know how you say that. But then you have a half, half brother, half sister, however you want to phrase that, and his name is Amnon, okay? Now, that doesn't make it any different or any, uh, any more right because he's not a full brother, full sister. It's still wrong. Okay, just so everybody's on the same page. Now, Kevin, or uh, Rich, if you would actually, would you go to, yep, there we go, the house of David's, the lineage. Okay, so here you have David. Okay, we're going to be talking a lot about Absalom. Okay, Absalom's mom would be Mekah. Okay, so same time, Mekah is also the mom of, am I? Uh, Tamar. T Tamar, thank you. Over here on Tamar, okay. But now Amnon, okay, has a different mom. Okay, Ahinoam is Amnon's mom. So David, okay, just to be a little bit more graphic, he has relations with Ahinoam and his, their son's name is Amnon. Is anybody else's head spinning right now? And then David had relations with Mekah, who then had Absalom and Tamar, okay? David has a whole lot of wives here, okay? And he's got concubines that aren't even listed on here. The concubines are going to cause problems down the road, okay? Nathan's even going to prophesy that they're going to have problems down the road. But we're not talking about concubines right now. This is just about the wives, okay? So some time passed. David's son, Absalom, okay? Now, Absalom had a beautiful sister, Tamar. David's son, Amnon, was infatuated with her. He is obsessed, okay, in love. It's gross. Lustful, right? All of these are for his sister, Amnon. Okay, that is your backdrop for the lovely story today. Oh, here we go. So it says this, scripture continues on. It says in verse two, Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin. Okay, so Tamar has not had any form of sexual relations with any other man, okay? And so Amnon was literally sick over his obsession uh, in love, lustful for Tamar. Like I'm slowing down on this for a reason because that's how disgusting and how wrong this already is. He was frustrated that he couldn't have her. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Leviticus 18 verse 11? Scripture says, you're not to have sexual intercourse with your father's wife's daughter who is adopted by your father. She is your sister. Okay. You're not supposed to have sex with your family. Do you remember Leviticus, you guys? Do you remember the, I had to preach an entire lesson on not having sexual relations with your family. And we thought talking about Saul going to the bathroom was bad. Oh no, this one is gonna be a humdinger. Let me just tell you this. So, oh, by the way, just so everybody's on the same page, 
It's forbidden. It's wrong. Okay? Just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Now, verse 3, Amnon had a friend. Now, anyway, if this dude has lustful thoughts for a sister, you know his buddies can't be good either. You know, like, it's just like bad company corrupts everything, right? And so, okay, hey, I have a friend named Jonadab. That's actually a cool name. He had a friend named Jonadab, a son of David's brother, Shemiah. And Jonadab was a very shrewd, shrewd man. He was crafty, he was shrewd, he was wise, and ready for this one? I think this is more important to even understand in any of these other words, he was experienced. That word's creepy to me. This man has experience in talking about these situations. That's actually what the word means. So then he says in verse 4, and he asked Amnon, hey, why are you the... Why are you, the king's son, so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Why doesn't he just say it's my half-sister? Because he knows it's weird. Scripture says in verse 5, Jonadab, the shrewd, experienced man, said, Lie down on your bed and pretend you're sick. I got an idea. I know how this could work. I mean, th this is their conversation. And when your father comes to see you, David is his name, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. In other words, could you, could you set it up for me, David? Let her prepare food in my presence so I can watch and eat from her hand. Just so you know, uh, you know, the, the eating environment, like he's actually in the same room, like, uh, like he can lay on the couch, he can lay on the bed, and he can watch her make food. Like it's a big open environment, okay? That was really important to understand. In verse 6, so Jonadab gives him an answer. So Amnon, in verse 6, he lays down and he pretends to be sick. And when the king, that would be David, came to see him, Amnon said, hey, please let my sister come and make a couple of cakes in my presence so I can eat from her hand. And David sent word to Tamar at the palace, please go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. In some weird scenario, I feel like David just participated uh, unknowingly, and yet because he's a passive father, uh, he should have known. But because he has no connection in so many ways, like that's how it feels. And so I don't know how you can make this connection. Maybe you guys can help me. But every time I pray about this verse, when talking and preparing for this, like I kept going back to Uriah the Hittite delivering the letter. Like I felt like David in some way literally just handed Tamar off to her demise. Then Tamar, Tamnar, Tamar, Tamar, Tamnon, hmm, Absalom, Adam Jai. I'm just telling you guys, these, there's so many names here. You tried this, right? <laughs> in verse 8, Then Tamar went to his house with Amnon lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his presence, and baked them. Okay, so apparently this food was going to help him feel better. Interesting enough, it says she brought the pan and set it down in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, Everyone leave me. And so everybody left. And so it says in verse 10, he says to Tamar, bring, me, bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told Tamar, so I can eat from your hand. Imagine in the culture back then, they still ate out of, out of people, they ate out of people's hands. I don't, I don't think they, I just think that'd be weird. If they did that, I'm glad I'm here. I don't know, but in today's culture, if that were to happen, it'd be like, hey, if you could get up and walk to your room, you could feed yourself. Yeah, you got two legs. <laughs> Tamar took the cakes so she had made and went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. Okay, so now it's getting set up. And when she brought them to, to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come sleep with me, my sister. All right. Remember how I talked to you guys about 2 Timothy 2.22? Okay, I want to I go there for a little bit here, okay? So this comes from uh, Luke Gilkerson here. But one of the things I want to just emphasize here, again, uh, just like David, didn't we do this for David? We walked through David's process. Now we're going to walk through Amnon. Here's what, one of the things I want to just say is that we have to learn to run from. Okay, now 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, flee from youthful passions. Uh, Clayton, what was Amnon's problem with Tamar? What was, his, what was his issue? He was obsessed with Tamar. He was totally obsessed. And the scripture says, at that point, you should flee from youthful passions. Like, don't even set yourself up. And in fact, what we really need to do is you need to run from them. And again, I know, remember we talked about this with David, you have to flee from this. This goes back to this. You have to run from this situation. I want to go through some, some uh, scripture verses here, Kevin. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19, it says, Run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Verse 19, 
Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. We must run. If you go back to verse 18, run from sexual immorality. And Amnon actually ran towards it. Now the scripture verse, 1 Peter 2, 11, and you know, for a while it's like, man, I, I really, I got to slow down on talking about like this, you know, sexual addictions or sexual issues or sexual problems. And then I'm like, wait, that seems to be one of the major issues in all of the church and in all of our culture. So I have no problem saying, hey, look, yesterday we talked about this and I'm going to talk about it again. Scripture says this in 1 Peter 2, 11, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. You run from the fleshly desires. Don't even put yourself in that room because I'm just telling you guys, you do not know how you will act in that situation. Romans 6.12. Romans 6.12 is talking about this running from mentality. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. Don't even let it be an option that it's in the same room. I mean, think about alcoholics. You know, after a while, they've learned that once they've been free and that they have, they're sober for a while, they don't even go, they don't even go, isn't this true for the most part? They don't even go into bars because they know that it's a temptation. And I respect people that get it. You cannot put yourself into these situations. Now, here's what's cr crazy. If some of you that are watching have an issue with, uh, you know, pornography on your computer, you know, the, the problem is, is that you probably use your computer a lot. Here's what I would tell you, is that you can't use your computer at home by yourself. It's not even an option. The only time you can ever use your computer is if somebody is literally around you in your office or at your home. Like, you cannot pursue these youthful passions. And that's what happened to Amnon. He did. He totally pursued his youthful passions. Kevin, if you go to one more, Colossians 3, 5, please. Colossians 3, 5, Scripture says this. Therefore, put to death... What belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. All I can tell you is that when Amnon, Amnon had this desire, he had to go the opposite and go to, uh, what was the guy's name, his buddy's name? Jonadab. You know, the Jonadabs, like he needed to go to Jonadab and be like, hey, I, I, I can't even be in the same room as her. Like, that's how drastic we need to be. I've always heard those stories of Billy Graham. He used to always have people go into his hotel room before he would travel to see if anybody would, would be in there as a setup. I've even heard stories about Billy Graham removing the television from his hotel room because he didn't want that to be an issue. All I'm just saying is, is you need to be drastic in order to not give in to the ways of the world. I think about what you said yesterday as we wrapped up about accountability. Heyman's accountability partner here didn't really help him out. No, he actually set it up. You know, for lack of better terms, I mean, he probably could have got paid for the gig. I mean, that's really what happens. He's working the system, and that's not a good friend. I'm going to come back to the run from. I'm going to get into a little bit more of this unfolding process. But, Kevin, you bring up a, a great point. So in verse 12, he says, Come sleep with me, sister. So the setup is in. She's brought the food. Verse 12, Don't, my brother, she cried. Don't humiliate me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't do this horrible thing. Interesting enough, uh, th and I've heard this, and again, I want to be extremely sensitive with this topic. I mean, we're talking about rape here. We're talking about Tamar, who does not want to have sexual relations with her half-brother. I mean, that in itself is incest. But she doesn't want to have sex outside. I mean, she's, she's a virgin. She doesn't want to go into this scenario. And the thing that people that I've heard and talked with people that have gone through to rape, it's a dis they feel disgraced, they feel humiliated, they feel violated. And, and look what she's saying. She's not even talking about the pain. She's talking about the humiliation. Like, how are people going to label her if this, takes, if this takes place? Verse 13, Scripture says, Where could I ever go with my disgrace? That's what Tamar's first thought is. Once this happens, do you know how I'm going to be labeled? And you would be like one of the immoral men in Israel. In other words, think about this before you even try to do this. And please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. Scripture says, though, in verse 14, right? But he refused to listen to her. And because he was stronger than she was, he raped her. This happens in culture a lot. And this word, he raped her, means he forced her. He humiliated her. And just so you guys know, a lot of the victims, they reference the humiliation more than they actually do the physical pain. And so here you have a brother who does not care at all about how Tamar feels. 
all he wants is really what he wants. That's it. Scripture continues on in verse 15. And after this, Am Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love he had loved her with. Get out of here, he said. In, in other words, it was this loyalty and this love that literally flipped. And I think even to the point because he hated himself about it. When you give in to sin, it's like something turns against you. In verse 16, no, she cried, sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Verse 17, scripture says, instead he called to the servant who waited on him, throw this woman out and bolt the door behind her. Literally, you can almost, it's almost like he's talking about Tamar, like she's a piece of trash. He used her, he abused her, and then he literally just, through, scripture says, threw her out. And so here's, here's, how, here's how Tamar had to respond. She was wearing a long sleeve garment because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. So she was a virgin coming into this. And so if you're a virgin, you're wearing a long sleeve garment. Some would even describe this uh, maybe as a, like a robe of many colors. That's another interpretation actually of the long sleeve garment. I think that's really a, a pretty picture there. But then because of that, in verse 19, Tamar put ashes on her head, tore the long sleeve garment she was wearing. So she now all of a sudden went from a virgin and celebrating to ripping her clothes. And it's scripture says she put ashes on her head, tore the garment that she was wearing, and then she put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Obviously, all of these are signs of mourning. Kevin, okay, would you go to Job 1, verse 20? Job 1, verse 20. Job 1 verse 20 says, And Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground, and he worshipped. Can you go to 2 verse 12? Job 2 verse 12. I just want to show you a picture of grieving and what that looks like. It says, When they looked from a distance, who, they could barely recognize him. So then it says, They wept aloud. Each man tore his robe, threw dust into the air, and on his head. So obviously, Tamar is in this form of, of grieving. Can you go to Jeremiah 2 verse 37 for me? Jeremiah 2, verse 37. Scripture says this, moreover, moreover, you will be led out from here with your hands on your head, since the Lord has rejected those you trust. You will not succeed even with their help. Right now, Tamar thinks there's no hope. Right now, in her process of putting a hand on her head, ripping her clothes, ashes, and then Absalom steps in. Okay, now if you go back, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Absalom, okay, here we have brother to Tamar, okay? Tamar is raped by, and then all of a sudden, the story of Absalom is just, it, it's crazy. Scripture says this, her brother Absalom said, has your brother Amnon been here with you? Be quiet for now. My sister, he's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. That's a strange way to say things, isn't it? So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. So here's, here's really what he's implying, okay? I need you to be quiet. I want you to avoid, you ready for this? A public scandal. King David is a king. King David is a political figure. Imagine if the president of the United States, whether it's with Obama or with President Trump, you know, within scandals under the, each presidency, like it's always like everybody's trying to keep everything quiet. In some regards, there's, it's no different here. And I'm not minimizing what happened. I'm just telling you this is a scenario. Don't take this thing to heart. In other words, hey, I have a plan. It's just now is not the time to release it. I know what happened. I'm not going to do anything about it yet. So here's the crazy thing is, and when King David heard about these things, he was furious. What would these things be, Kevin, that he heard about? Well, he would have heard about her mourning and tearing the sleeves, so for sure. He would have questioned servants and what was going on. I, the rape, the whole works. Yep, I think he knew about everything. David knew about these things, and he was furious. But that's all it says. He was mad. At this point, it doesn't say he went to Amnon. At this point, it doesn't say he went to Absalom. At this point, it doesn't even say he went to Tamar. It just says he was mad. And so in verse 22, it, it's almost like the families that have things under their, uh, in, in their, uh, the, the bad things in their family, it's almost kind of like you just, you take a, a, you know, a broom and you just sweep it under the rug. Like, hey, let's just, I don't like that, but let's not talk about it. Absalom says, let's not say anything. Let's just, let's just put it on the rug and hope that nobody talks about it at this point. And Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. So, just so we know, and on the same page here, David knew and Absalom knew. 
you have a dad and a brother that knew that his daughter, his sister was raped. And right now they didn't do anything about it. At least until this this point. Scripture continues on. He was delayed for two years, it says. Two years later, Absalom's sheep shears were at Baal Hazor near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. Okay, verse 24. So two years later, that's how much time has gone past. Is everybody on the same page here? So two years have passed. Now the story continues. So remember, he's hired sheep shears, okay? Um, can you go back one more for me? Thanks. Okay, go to verse 24. Then he went to the king, and so he went to King, king David. And he said, your servant has just hired sheep shears. Will the king and his servants please come with your servant? Hey, I want to set up. I've got a plan. I've been working on this plan. Verse 25, the king replied to Absalom, no, my son, we should not go. We, we don't need to go watch the sheep shears. <laughs> we would be a burden to you anyway. So although Absalom has urged him, he wasn't willing to go, though he did bless him. So he blessed Absalom. Did you catch this again? David did it again. David did it again. He sent Tamar, right, to the brother who was sick, and now he's sending Absalom in his blessing to go to Amnon. It's all a setup. Now watch as this continues to go on in verse 26. If not, Absalom said, please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king said, why should he go with you? Again, if he knew his kids, this would be a weird question. Why, why, why should he go with you? Oh, well, in verse 27, but Absalom urged him, so he sent Amnon and all the king's sons. It's kind of like, as a passive dad, I just I don't want to deal with this stuff. Yeah, sure, go ahead, kids. Hey, dad, can I have five bucks to go play some games? Sure. But the passive dad doesn't ever ask, really, what are the games? He doesn't really ask, what are you doing with the money? So it says he sent Amnon and all the king's sons. In verse 28, Absalom commanded his young men, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to watch Amnon. Remember, the guy, the half-brother that had uh, raped my sister Tamar, you, you, you go to him until he's in a good mood and he's going to get drunk. When I order you to strike Amnon, from, because he's been drunk from the wine, he's in a good mood with the wine, here's what I, I want you to kill him. So Absalom, you got this, is now playing the role of his dad. Hey, by the way, would you go kill this guy who did this to this person? Kill him. Don't be afraid. I'm, uh, don't be afraid. Am I not the one who has commanded you? In other words, I'm in charge here, so you're fine. Be strong and courageous. In verse 29, Scripture says this. So Absalom's young men did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the rest of the king's sons got up and each fled on his mule. Who thinks of fleeting and fledding, running fast? Get the word on a mule. Not me. Giddy up. You know, <laughs> anyway, I think you get the point. So all of a sudden, just so everybody knows, what has just happened? Amnon is dead. And guess what? Absalom did it. No, I know he didn't do it, but he did it. Is that fair to say? He set it up. He murdered his own brother. And oh, by the way, can I just tell you this? David? Even though he didn't do it, he did it. He blessed it. Then all the rest of the sons, remember they got off on the mule. Can you keep going to verse 30? Scripture says, when they're on the way, a report reached David. Absalom struck down all the king's sons. Not even one of them survived. Well, I don't know where they got this report from. Right? In verse 31, in response, the king stood up, tore his clothes, lay down on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their torn clothes. Because right now, what does he know? They're all dead. All of his sons, all dead. Whoa, that was pretty drastic. Verse 32, scripture says this, but Jonadab, oh, hey, here's Jonadab, son of David's brother Shimeah, right? So here he is again, this guy up here, the cousin, the wicked counsel. Hey, my Lord must not think they've killed all the young men, the king's sons, because only Amnon is dead. In fact, Absalom has planned this ever since the day Amnon disgraced his sister Tamar. Wait a minute. Which side is Jonadab on? Dude, this guy, huh? He knows how to work the system. And man, let me tell you this, He's doing a good job working the system, right? Ever since this, keep going to verse 33. So now, my Lord, don't take this seriously. The report that says all the king's sons are dead. No, 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 just Amnon. Verse 34. Meanwhile, Absalom has fled. Yeah, of course, you think? So now Absalom has fled. Why? Because he murdered his brother. And when the young man was standing, watched, looked up, there were many people coming from the road west of him from the side of the mountain. So, of course, there's a watchman, right? This is what you do when you're a king. Verse 35. John Madab said to the king, look, the king's sons have come. It's exactly like your servant said. Verse 36, just as he finished speaking, the king's sons entered and wept loudly. The king and all of his servants wept bitterly. Verse 37, 
Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amahud, king of Geshur. Okay, now this is really interesting. And David mourned for his son every day. David mourned for his son every day. Now guess what? Verse 38, Absalom was gone for how long? Three years. Do you know how long then David mourned for? Three years. David mourned because his son was gone. So now David is mourning for three years. This family, you guys, is radically messed up. In fact, Absalom fled to Geshur, where it was uh, about 80 miles. And remember, this is his maternal grandparents, okay? So his mom's side is where he fled to. Yeah, good choice. And the scripture says in verse 39, Then King David longed to go to Absalom, for David had finished grieving over Amnon's death. Here's how I want to close all of this. This is a lot. I get all this. I wanted to do all of this because I feel like, like because he didn't run from the youthful passions, look at this chaos. Look, look at the chaos. Dead, murdered, mourning, people fleeing, lustful thoughts, blessing things that are not of the Lord. Like all of this because one person decided not to flee from the youthful passions. What I don't get is that when people fall into sin, they forget how it impacts so many other people. When people want to get a divorce, you forget how it impacts your kids. And the next thing you know, that brings in another whole family. It's just messy. Flee from your youthful passions. Run from these youthful passions. And can I just tell you, here's what we got to do. We have to do this. We have to run to, Scripture says, righteousness, faith, love, and peace. You flee the youthful passions, correct? But then you pursue and you run to the righteousness. Okay? The faith the love, and the peace. But none of, none of this happened. All of the chaos did. All it would take is to run from this and then run to this. And then, Kevin, you had mentioned something as well, and I really like this. You got to know who you can run with. Jonadab, right? Wasn't that his name? Jonadab gave bad counsel over and over. He's not the guy you want to run with. According to 2 Timothy 2.22, you run along those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is who we need to run with. Those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. It started with one man, Amnon, who gave into his youthful passions and then this happened. I bet a lot of people watching today, if you can even read my writing, would say, you know, that, that's part of my family right now. Like I grew up with this or I know somebody that has this, or my community lives like this, or my neighborhood is like this. And all I want to just say is we can actually stop this cycle. You can stop this cycle right now when you have the mentality of running from something and running to and running with. The story of Absalom, Tamar, and Amnon. There's a lot there, but I really believe there's truths that apply to us today. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow.